Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Let's Process That podcast. I'm Emily Christopher. I'm Nick Connor Camp. We're so glad you have joined us, friends. I know it's been a minute. If you caught my uh, little social media video a couple of days ago last week, um, I was just letting you know life's been happening. We've been moving, we've been grooving. I've been traveling. Nick's gotten into all kinds of stuff. Um, which I'm sure he will talk about some of that later. Um, But a lot of it's going to be today. So I appreciate your patience as we are real human beings with life going on. And sometimes things shift and change. And we're, um, what is that word, that little phrase, intentionally flexible. Um, Oh, yes, pulling one out from the ether. Um, And we, yeah, we want to honor that, respect that, and we appreciate that you guys do the same for us. Um, So... Today's episode, I'm so excited. I've been waiting to do this episode for such a long time, since last year, and that is all about Nick's book. Yes, that's right. I feel like we've been teasing it from like, you. Start, look, look at it. Ah, if you're, if you're listening um, audio only, um, he'll tell you how to look it up, but the book cover is amazing. Um, I'm excited. I'm going to let you talk about all of your stuff. I'm going to let you give a quick spiel. And then I actually made interview questions. I did some research on how to interview an author. So I've got some questions for you, Nick. Um, But first, I want you to just kind of give us an overall uh, spiel. And then we'll get into really digging deeper into this book and what it's all about and how you got started and where this is taking you, all that fun stuff. So go for it. Love to. So I've always wanted to write a book. You know, when I spent most of my life as a pastor, lots of study, lots of reading of books, lots of writing, but just never put some stuff together. And I worked on a, a part of a book as part of a Bible it's college course. It wasn't well produced or anything like that. Didn't put it on the market. And um, and so last year, I'm going to retell a story I told last season. There's going to be some folks that don't know this. I was part of a, um, a group called a Spark Group where you take a risk five weeks in a row. You have some friends with you. Everybody tells you what risk they're going to take. And then the next week they report back about what risk, how the risk went. And in week one, I already had mine done, ready to go. I said, the first thing I'm going to do is there's a guy named Sterling Gardner, who's a digital marketing guy that's from L.A., and he's in Asheville. And I'm going to call him, ask him for lunch. And I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do. I said, I don't know why. I just feel compelled that this guy has some kind of next step in my road. And I'm just going to do whatever he tells me to do. So I reached out to Sterling. Can I take you to lunch? He said, yeah. I take him to lunch on that Tuesday. And um, and so we sit down. We're waiting on our barbecue. And he says, so why are we here? And I said, well, I don't want to tell you. Can we wait till the end of the conversation? I promise I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't want any money. I, but I want to wait to the end of the conversation to tell you why we're having it. And he said, okay. So we talked for about five minutes. And about five minutes in, he asked me a serious forgiveness question. And I said, well, here's my thoughts on that. And I gave him two or three ideas. And he says, you have to write a book on forgiveness. He said, what you just told me is not out there. You have to write a book on forgiveness. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> I was I was going to, like, apply for a job. I was going to, like, I don't know what I was going to do but not write a book. And so he's like, you got to write a book on forgiveness. And so about um, two, three weeks, I came back, reported that to my Spark group, and I agreed to do it. And about two weeks later, he sends me an ad of a book that's out there, How to Write a Book in 90 Days. And it was $7 for audio. I went ahead and bought it. It literally took less than an hour to listen to it. And it gave me one idea. One idea. And and this is my question for you, Emily. How much is an idea worth? So it gave me one idea. So I paid $7, one idea. The idea was this. Write the book. Mm -hmm. Don't try to write more than a book. Don't try to write the world's best book. Don't try. Just write everything you know about the subject of forgiveness in 90 days. That that was the whole idea of this book. Now, if I only use that idea once, it cost me $7. If I use that idea seven times, it really only cost me a dollar, right? So I just said, you know what? I'm going to write for 90 days as much as I know about forgiveness, and we're going to go from there. So for the first three months, I wrote, and then in the last six months was all about editing, proofreading, 
paying somebody to do cover art and you know all that kind of stuff the layout on the inside and i'm literally announcing tonight after this podcast on social media my website nickconnorcampbooks.com where you can order your book so anyway that's how it all began was our friend sterling garner and i'm pretty sure we got him coming up right yes uh sterling will be our next episode so you guys will get to know him a lot more and that'll be really awesome yeah so that that it's 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 the writing part to me is not as hard as the editing part and Mm -hmm. all the other pieces that got to come together it it, shout out to diana flagel who has helped been helping me for years i had no idea how hard all this stuff was it is hard stuff but as of tonight, uh, you can actually buy the book at nickconnorcampbooks.com. I'm pretty excited about it. So there you go. That's my short little spiel. Sterling, nice. for whatever reason, said you got to write a book on forgiveness. And I just did it. And it's been fun. That is awesome. Well, we're going to dive into more of like sure. process. Um, because one of my, just, I, I'm always fascinated with artist processes, people's creative process, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but I also want to remind everybody, we're going to link everything and how to find his book in the description. Um, so wherever you're listening, if you go to the description, you will be able to find those easy links and get to Nick's books uh, or book. Ooh, maybe I'm prophesying books. Um, so we will have all that. So I first want to start by asking you, um, when did you first realize that you wanted to write? I know you've been writing for a while. You used to have a blog. Um, you've started other books, but they've never been published. But when was the first time that you were like, hmm, I'm going to really take this writing thing seriously, whether that was even for, I know you journal, um, but even from like, I want to give this to the world, or this could be something more than a personal writing assignment that I do for myself. So I've always loved great quotes these, these one sentence, two sentence things that when you look at it, you see the whole world differently from that point forward. Mm-hmm. And I loved when I got a chance to preach and share great concepts, teaching principles, or a quote that I'd found in a book somewhere. But I am very much an auditory kind of person. I, 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 I'm a speaker. I'm not a writer. I haven't been a writer. And then um, what happened, but I would write out my sermons and I would highlight the quotes and when, when I say this, her face is going to melt off. I mean, they're going to love this one right here. And I loved having those zingers that just, it just imprinted on your life. Mm -hmm. And then um, we hired a young woman on our staff that was a social media guru. And she was like, Hey, Nick, you really should... (laughs) You Wonder really should is. start a blog. <laughs> yeah, you. And it's like you really should like have a blog and like actually post stuff on you know Facebook and Instagram. I said Insta what? And you're like yeah. And so you're like you know Nick, you're doing all this work and you're reaching the room, but there's no ripple effect anywhere. We need to get you out there and at least just start putting some of your ideas and your thoughts out there. And have some fun with it. And I did. And then we were had a Bible college course coming up and on a subject. And one day the Lord just started downloading a bunch of stuff to me. And I just started writing. And it came pretty effortless to me to get it on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, I still need a book doctor at the end of all that. The book doctor is higher than an editor. It's oh. someone that goes way beyond editing. It's okay. like, let me, this is a hot mess, but let me fix it. And so that's when I did a book and was the first time I actually got something on paper where I was like, you know, I need to put more stuff on paper that's going to outlive me. Even if I write just for my two sons and I put every, all the knowledge and wisdom I have, put it in a book and pass it on. And that legacy piece became very important to me. And I hadn't done anything with it until I bumped into Sterling Gardner, this stranger in my world that I didn't even know. And he said, write a book on forgiveness. I couldn't have predicted that in a million years. And just for timeline's sake, because even I want to, I can't remember. When when did you and Sterling initially meet and go to lunch where he said all that to you? Was that about a year ago? Yeah, nine months ago. Nine months ago. Okay, awesome. And so you've had this experience, you know, with blogging and some of this writing and some of this writing kind of just for the legacy's sake. Um, but what other than Sterling, was there anything outside there that you were like, 
I have a subject or a topic, was it very evident that it was going to be on forgiveness before you had that conversation or was it strictly out of that conversation? Forgiveness was the topic. He could have told me that I needed to take a class on how to milk cows. I had no idea what he'd tell me to do. When he said mm-hmm. write a book, I, this is not one. You know, this is not one I would have picked. I, I, I would say to you though that Diana Flago, who is a, a an editor and a book publisher, um, constantly would come to me after I'd preach a sermon, and she would say that sermon series is a book. You just preached four sermons in a row about about you know transition and change. You should write that into a book. And and she would constantly come to me. You should put that in a book. You should make that a book. And and so I would try a little of this, try a little of that. But I was busy as a senior pastor. But that was probably the first time that I became really aware, having someone in the industry saying, "Why are you doing?" speaking only why are you not writing this down and putting this out and so this really is the first time that i have taken all of that made it in a priority and put time effort and energy into it nice um what did it look like actually writing what did that look like for your schedule did you have a routine a regimen where was most of the writing done yeah I think that's a great question because if you ask people, there are some artists that say, you know, I only write when the inspiration hits me. And then you have a lot of other folks, you know, big authors like Stephen King that say, no, you write every day. It's your job. You show up and you write until inspiration starts flowing. You sometimes are having a bad day. It's chaotic. you got stuff going on at the house. For me, setting aside time every, usually every day, but at least every week, where I said, okay, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm going to write. And I started by just brain dumping, just what what are some thoughts, some ideas, some examples, some stories in my life. And I just started brain dumping and just spent an hour putting everything I remembered about forgiveness, that time somebody was mad at me, but they forgave me, that time I was mad at somebody else and I forgave them, uh, a quote, anything like that. And then early in the process, I began to look over that and break them down into you know different chapters, like really looking to say, okay, these three things go together, those five things go together, this goes over there, and then looking at the table of contents to say, have I covered the subject? Have I left any glaring um, in omissions anywhere that I need to go ahead and add that piece in? And then from there, it was pretty easy to say, okay, I've got 10 chapters. I'm covering the things I want to cover. Now it's time to pick up chapter one. And I've got, you know, two stories and five notes, and it's time to build a chapter. And that is, you know, that was basically the process. But I didn't I didn't fall into the train of thought that you only pick up the pen when you have inspiration. Mm-hmm. I lean towards you write until the inspiration takes over. Mm-hmm. And... That's that that worked for me. Yeah, I I totally get that. And that was a hard concept for me when I was in my big songwriting days. <laughs> like um one of my fellow uh songwriters and who actually produced my uh album years ago was Chris Pruitt and he would be like mm-hmm. you just need to write every day. Like I have seasons of life where I wake up and I just write every morning. I try to write out a verse, a chorus, even if it's just a few lines. And um, I think that's a hard place sometimes as people think that like inspiration strikes and then I wrote 500 pages or I wrote mm-hmm. 15 songs today. But really, it I think most of it really comes from consistency and discipline. Mm-hmm. So then my next question for you is where was your favorite place to write or where did you feel like like as somebody I know – affected by environment like when we would have our team meetings back when we were on staff together like you were very intentional with like let's get out of the office let's like go to a cabin in the woods um let's go somewhere where we're not just in these like same walls that we're always in so was that the same for your writing did you feel like you needed to go a certain place or like was there just a place that you felt so comfortable that it could kind of flow easier well what's interesting is i got most of my writing done at one location but I really liked the front deck of our house. It, you know, I could chill out out there. I could get some writing done when the weather was nice. You know, it wasn't winter time or anything like that. But back in May or June, I was at Atlantic Beach mm-hmm. and for a week vacation. 
And I went to a coffee house at Atlantic Beach every morning for about two hours by myself. And I sat outside and it was like always 80, 85 degrees, wonderful. And I pumped out several chapters while I was on vacation because I didn't, I didn't have a job, didn't have to worry about anything around the house. And I'd spend most, we'd go to the beach most of the afternoon, but that morning I'd have to myself and I'd just get up, go get some coffee. And I wrote several chapters sitting outside that little cafe. In fact, one day I'll get back there and I'll get a souvenir. I had no idea how instrumental that place would be, yeah. but it ended up probably a third of my book or more was written in that week at that cafe. Now I've done a ton of editing, yeah. but I mean, just sitting down and pouring stuff out and getting it on paper happened there. That's awesome. So outside of that third there, how was it to write and also work full time? You've got, you know, your wife, you've got uh, traveling, you got all kinds of stuff. What does it look like to incorporate writing as such an instrumental part in your life when you have so much else going on? Yeah, it, it's, you know, my job takes up a lot of hours and takes, you know, just a lot of effort and energy. Uh, wife, kids, uh, grandkid, mm -hmm. brainer, um, and then a podcast at the same time. You know, remember, we started all this at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I would never start a podcast and a book and some other things I'll talk about at some point at the same time, but, um, it just makes, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? Right. And I really mean that to I don't care if you're in your twenties or your thirties, if you don't do it now, will you ever do it? And if I, if I'd known then that I was embarking on a nine month journey, I don't know that I would have done it as, as passionately as I did, mm -hmm. but I literally would sit down and I'd look at my week and I'd say, okay, I got to do this and this and this for the podcast. I'll put them on these days. I need to do this, this, and this for the book. I'll put them on these days. And then I've got these other personal stuff that I want. And every week I had to plan out, when will I set aside time to write the book? Mm -hmm. And and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the book. I'm proud that I finished the journey. Uh, I'll, I will end up writing more books. You said, you know, it's actually nickhonorcampbooks.com because I do expect to have more books in the next couple of years up there. But um, I was just paving the runway on this one. How does it work? What works for me? What doesn't work for me? And so there's always obstacles in life to keep us. If, if I was to go to someone else who was too busy this last year to write a book, I would say, what have you done that you feel like is substantial enough that it would have matched if you'd written a book? And most of us say, well, I was busy, but I don't know that I did anything, you know, that important, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really is making yourself a priority. And I think for me, I'm very task-oriented and stuff like that. So I feel like that helped me stay on task and get it done. Awesome. So I have another rant. This question is not on my interview question list. Have you and um, Tina ever work together like she is working on a painting and you're sitting in a chair writing like do you guys ever do that or is it totally different processes and like different things going on in my head I have this beautiful picture of you like she's painting and you're writing and it's just very like beautiful <laughs> oh gosh Jim, you're killing me I know no, well, you know I romanticize that... everything I was getting ready to say no it's not near that romantic first of all she is way more accomplished as a painter than I am as a writer um, and, um, she's an introvert, sets certain music, has her light a certain way. She has her whole process. I literally can grab my Mac computer and go to a coffee house or do something else 10 times easier just to do it at different times and different ways. It's sort of like, you know, you're a worship leader and someone wants to have a painter on stage and then they want some other stuff and it. And it, it does go together, but, um, but no, that did not. Darn. That was romantic. Hallmark could make yes. that movie, Em. We I should do it. that one. Okay. Well, here's our pitch, Hallmark. Listen up. Um, what would you say is your strength as a writer? Mm. I, Yeah, I would... One of the things that I've often been told um, when I speak is that people say, you made that very accessible. You took something complicated and made it very simple. I could understand that. 
um, you know, God's a mysterious subject. And I would talk about something. They're like, yeah, I get that. That that made sense. I've been to other churches where pastors were more educated than you. I walked away very impressed at how much they knew, but I realized I didn't know anything. But with being in you, being with you, I, I feel like I know more after hearing you talk. Well, in writing the same way, I didn't want this to be a huge book. I didn't want it to be complicated. I didn't want it to to mesmerize people with my wisdom or information. I wanted to bring across simple concepts that anybody could apply to their life to make their life better. Because I truly believe that when we forgive someone, it's really a gift for ourselves. It's not for the other person. And I really wanted to make this very accessible to people. And so I think that probably my strength is taking something and, and saying it succinctly in a way you can understand. I like that. That's awesome. Um, if you could tell your younger self anything about writing, what would you say? Right now. Right now. Mm-hmm. Do not wait. There's, you're going to have kids. You're going to have grandkids. You're going to have careers. You're going to have all that stuff, and it's never going to slow down. Mm-hmm. It's never going to change. You, I, honestly, most of us create the pace of our own life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I could start over tomorrow and I would create the same level of energy and chaos as I have right now because it's just who I am. And so I would say to my younger self right now, it has to be part of your life. And I probably would have captured a lot of the study I was doing and a lot of things I was speaking was for one sermon. It was just to get it out, one sermon, move on to the next. I would have captured a lot more of that and not thrown that away and had and had it available, like Diana said, to build something a little bigger, but give it away to the world. So that's what I'd probably say. That's good. I had a feeling that's what you would say. <laughs> like, really? just do it. Just go. Well, yeah, because yeah, I mean, even for you, you've had a really accomplished career. You've been so impactful to so many people's lives. And I know there's I don't, something about a book that's so special is that it, it encapsul- encapsulates something and we can like pull it off the shelf and we get that wisdom or we get that story or we get that feeling again. And I think there's a lot of people who would, who would have wished that there were some even nuggets and like um, wisdom that yes, you have in sermons. And thankfully we have technology that's recorded a lot of those, but sometimes it's harder to go back and dig through archives yeah. versus um, just grabbing a book. So yeah, I, I had a feeling that you'd, you would be like, just go ahead and start doing it. Yes, you're busy. Yes, a million things are going on. And I feel like that's almost kind of the uh, reoccurring thing that I'm even hearing woven, woven through this is like, hey, if you've got a dream right now or you have a desire, just do it. Like make some kind of space, whether it's like even 15 minutes to do that thing. Yeah. Um, just make some margin in your life for it. Um, so next question I have, what would you say is your interesting writing quirk? Do you have any quirks when you write? I'll tell you one that I that I I learned at a workshop, and I don't know that anybody uses it for real, but um, I've started writing an autobiography. Mm. And one of the things they tell you to do is write your life story in 50 words. And you're like, oh, and they say, you got five minutes. And so oh you got, obviously you have to leave out a lot. Mm-hmm. So you write your, you write your life story in 50 words. And then they say, okay, now write it in 20 words. And you have five minutes to write it in 20 words. Mm-hmm. And then they ask you to read your life story in 20 words to the rest of the room. And I would read my story in 20 words. And people would be like, I want to know the backstory to that thing. Cause you know, I have an interesting childhood. And so, um, and so I started writing an autobiography and every chapter I write 20 words is, is the synopsis of the whole chapter. So my Marine Corps years, I write 20 words and then I write the chapter and I fill it out. But my hope is that that 20 word hook will grab your attention and say, that's interesting. I want to hear what goes in between those words and fills out that story. And now it's not in this forgiveness book, but I think that is a really interesting quirk to turn the chat. I would just see somebody finishing a chapter, getting ready to go to bed and say, but I want to see what the 20 words is for mm-hmm. tomorrow night, you know? And then you see the 20 words and you're like, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll stay up and read a little while. 
I love that. That is awesome. Oh gosh, that's exciting. I wrote, when you said that, if you're again, if you're listening audio, you didn't see my face, but I can't imagine writing a whole life story in 50 words, let alone 20. So I think that would be a really cool thing, especially for an autobiography. Um, wow. So all of this writing stuff, everything coming out, what do you feel like has changed about you? Do you feel like doing this next thing? Has it inspired you? Has it empowered you? What is it about this accomplishment? Because it really is such, I mean, writing a book is a huge deal. Um, what has yeah. it done for you? Yeah, I want to answer that, but then I also want to talk for a second about the journey with forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because actually when you write about something, you attract to you quotes, books, information, stories, and you begin almost start dating forgiveness mm. as a subject. Wow. And I want to talk about that in just a second. Yeah. But um, I think that um, finishing the book, I didn't write this to, you know, to be a big money maker or to make me famous or anything like that. I wrote this book because I felt like that a sage on the side of my road said, you have to write this book. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it unlocks. It may unlock one relationship. It may unlock the, pay, the, the runway for me to write a second book and a third book. And maybe one of those books really becomes popular, mm -hmm. gets in people's hands and makes a difference in people's lives. That's what I would hope it would happen. Mm -hmm. But I think for me is I just wanted to finish the book. I wanted to take my heart and pour it into one subject, walk it all the way through, do all the hard work and have it in my hands and know that anything that I'm inspired to do next, I know how to do it. I, I'm not afraid of it. I know how to get it done. And I'm really excited. I've actually been daydreaming about what I'm going to write next. So empowered, inspired, um, Yes, all of those things is what happened on this journey. And, and there's a quote that says, if you do the thing, you get the power. Mm. And so if, if you show up and just do the thing, suddenly you have power over it. You have the superpower. And when you write the book, now you can write books. And so is there a subject that I'm interested in three years from now? Well, now I already know how to do that. And so back to your point, write the blog, write the song, write the book, just write, just put it down. Even if you never publish it, put it down, capture it. And I think that it gives you the power. Then in the future, it's nothing intimidates you off of that. You're like, I know how to do that. I know what it's going to cost. Let's go ahead and budget our time. and Let's do that thing. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this deep relationship and knowing that you experience with forgiveness as a topic, as a process, yeah. What was the obstacles with that? Like really sitting with something? Was there a time where you kind of discovered some unforgiveness? Like, did you have to face some things as you were writing that you weren't necessarily expecting to? You can't write a book about forgiveness and not being truthful with yourself about have you forgiven people. Mm -hmm. And so some of the exercises I give in the book, I actually did myself and I list names of people. And anyone that immediately I just had any kind of negative thought. And I had to sit with each one of those people. And I had to, not personally, I didn't go to each one of them. I had to sit with myself with that person. And some of them, I had done something that had hurt that other person. And, you know, I had to forgive myself. And I had to work through some of that. I had to go ahead and forgive a couple of people that maybe I hadn't been proactive about. And I was determined that when I release this book, I'm not going to be holding unforgiveness towards anybody. And that was a commitment I made to myself that I didn't know I could keep. I mean, I, I it, you know, it's going to take the journey. And yeah, one of the most interesting things that came out of it is as I'm talking about, yeah, I'm writing this book on forgiveness. A couple of people pulled me aside and said, are you writing it because of me? Am I in your book? And And, and I was like, nobody's in my book. I'm not writing this as... This is not a tell-all. Yeah, I'm not. It's not a tell-all. I'm not using yeah. people's names and what they did to me to talk about forgiveness. Oh but gosh. people literally thought they were the root of the reason I wanted to write this book. And then you said, and "You better like, go figure that out for yourself." That's just yeah. <laughs> it, it, the whole world's not about you. Um, oh, so, it, but but it was interesting. Because from their perspective, I, in my perspective, I've moved on from any of that. I've moved on. I don't hold on to forgiveness. I'm good. 
But from their perspective, they weren't so sure. And I thought that that was very interesting was, is this a tell-all book that you're going to get even with all of us? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't do that, first of all. Oh, my gosh. But but you truly do date the subject that you're writing about because you think about it. You see the word somewhere or you hear a quote or you watch somebody and they, they, they're like, oh, really? You're talking about forgiveness? Well, how do you forgive my husband or my wife when she did this? And what about that? And you pick up stories and opportunities and it really does become this extra relationship in your life for the nine months year that you're writing. Yeah. Fascinating. Didn't see that one coming. Yeah. So when you started writing, how would you say that, I guess, I mean, obviously a lot of, all of us are going to have to deal with forgiveness at different levels, different seasons. Yeah. Do you feel like because of the intimacy that you've had with the book and the topic and all that, do you feel like you grew exponentially in forgiveness or did you have a better understanding? What, uh, and again, this kind of goes on like the journey with it, but where would you say from the time you started till right now, it's, it's out, it's ready for the public. Where would you say that that forgiveness meter, if you will, where, how okay. did that grow? How was that growth and what did that look like um, for you? Okay. So first of all, I, I mentioned this in the book that for whatever reason, I've really never struggled with holding grudges and stuff like that. I, people talk to me about things that have happened to them and, and how bitter they are. I just have never struggled with that. And I, and I don't know why. Yes, I get hurt. Yes, I have to struggle to forgive somebody, but I do. And I get over it and I move on and I can see enemies of mine in the store and I'll say, hey, how you doing? And I, I just, for some reason, I've been able to do that. When you start diving into this relationship, obviously you're going to have some new opportunities to forgive some people, first of all. Mm-hmm. Number two, the hardest person forgives yourself. And so you you regularly pull up an issue and you're like, oh, I haven't dealt with that. I've, I'm still carrying that towards myself. I would say probably I was at a seven and my meter moved to eight and a half okay. um, on, on the forgiveness side. If it was a different topic, almost any other topic, and I would have said I probably went from a three to a nine. But because for whatever reason, and that's probably why I was picked to write the book, you know? Right. Is for whatever reason, I had some experiences. I had uh, forgiveness to become important in my life so much that I began helping other people forgive me and forgive others and sort of standing in the gap and helping them forgive other people. And it, and it was so important to me to help other people get rid of that hatred and that bitterness and that yucky venom and all that stuff that I was already at a seven probably when I wrote the book, but definitely by dating the subject of forgiveness for nine months, I definitely probably went to a nine. Now, please pray for me because God only knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Or when the first critic goes on Amazon and says, well, I read the book and let me tell you a couple of things. And so I don't know what that, you know, you and I both have had our share of critics, but it's never fun, especially if you put your heart into something for nine months. So I'm, I'm preparing myself for that. And then I'll tell you to go back and listen to our episode on the critic and criticism. <laughs> that's right. Be like, that's remind what yourself. Do. Um, yep. Yeah, because and that's a whole other kind of thing that would be interesting. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts because um, I know with things that I've created that are very near and dear to my heart, right? They do feel like this is my baby, <laughs> and yep. Yep. it is scary to let this baby go to the world and just let anyone comment on it or have an opinion on it and especially a topic that is very triggering to a lot of people um yeah like this can be you know somebody who has a negative thing to say back this could be actually about their stepfather you know it's like oh this has nothing to do with even um any content that i put on here except that forgiveness is a trigger for you or forgiveness is a a place of unresolved uh issue, problem, whatever it may be. So um, it'll be interesting to see that as well, because this is this is not a, a light and easy, like you didn't write a book on like hope and joy. Like you did something that takes people decades sometimes yeah. to get even to move the needle in their heart or mind on. So um, yeah, 
It'll it's a it's a tough one. So I want to speak to that for just a second, but mm-hmm. before I do, okay, I wasn't going to tell you this, but oh. I'm going to tell it to you now. Oh boy! So I've I hired a writer writer's coach, and he tells you the process of how to self publish. You do this first. Mm-hmm. You hire somebody to do the cover art, hire somebody to do the layout, get hire a proofreader, all that kind of stuff. And so he proposed a couple of names to me for proofreaders. And you actually have to do three proofreadings. So you do a proofreading, then you send it to a second proofreader and a third proofreader. And there's still one mistake in the book that I can see. And you try to get them all, but 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 you had to go through proof, three proofreaders. So I send the manuscript to two or three proofreaders and ask them for how long it would take them to proofread it. And second of all, if they would give me a quote of what it's going to cost. Mm. And one of the guys sent me it back and said, I can't work on your project. It's not biblical. It's not right. It's full of self-love. And nothing in the Bible tells us about self-love. I can't put my name on this. There's no way I would even proofread this. And what? I, I was stunned. I was stunned. This dude has rejected my manuscript when he's barely breezed through it. Yeah, yeah. He must have landed on a page or two that triggered something. I don't know. I can't find anything in here that I think is controversial at all. But to be rejected by a guy you're trying to pay yeah. To pre-feed your book. I mean, think about this if you were um, like you, Emily, if somebody sent you a song and asked you to clean it up a little bit mm-hmm. and you're like, this song is so gross, I won't even touch it, right? But they're paying you. Yeah. And this guy's like, nope, don't want your money. Can't put my name on it. Not going to touch it. And I was like, okay, how does I feel? I, I had to check myself. Am, am, I, am I mad? Am I angry? Do I feel yeah. hurt? Do I need to forgive this guy? And I, when I look back at the email, I said, you know, I think this has a lot more to do with what he's dealing with than what my book is actually about. Yeah. And, and a lot of times that's what happens. Now, skipping forward to what you said, because I think that there's a couple key pieces with forgiveness that are they're difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, the first is that forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. When you hold unforgiveness, your thought life is contaminated. You're thinking about revenge. You want to hurt the person. Uh, if anybody else makes a comment anywhere near what they said, then then, then you're having to ju- deal with that too. Is Are you really a bad person? Or are you not a bad person? You see them and, and you cringe and you think about them for the next three days. And Forgiveness is evicting uh, your abuser from your head and saying, I'm not going to let you have, you know, one of the quotes in the book is that my abuser lives in my head rent free Mm -hmm. and that's just a powerful painful thought that Mm -hmm. your abuser could live in your head rent free and so how do we get rid of that person by forgiving them so that they no longer consume our thoughts the second thing is what happens if i forgive somebody and they keep violating me Mm -hmm. and in the book i'm very clear don't let them keep violating you 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 put up boundaries and you do not let them. But what if it's my mother? Well, then you don't go to your mother's for Thanksgiving. Um, you put up boundaries and you protect yourself and you forgive them for the past, but you remove the possibility of them doing it again until their behavior changes. Yeah. And, and then the, 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 the big one, which is always, um, if I forgive somebody, am I letting them off the hook? Like say there's a break in trust. You can forgive someone who has broken your trust, but you do not have to reestablish relationship with them until they prove that they're trustworthy. And, um, and, and those are some big issues because people are like, yeah, but the person that keeps hurting me is in my family. And I'm like, you can distance them in some ways, put up some boundaries, put up some guardrails. And there's nothing wrong with forgiving somebody who's violated you but demanding that they produce better behavior and earn your trust before you let them back in your life. And those are some tricky things that people get hung up on and get stuck on that I try to address in this book. Yeah. Oh, lots of good stuff. Lots and lots of good stuff. Um, So your ultimate hope for this first book, this first published book, what, what is your hope for that? For it to pay for itself. Just get to, <laughs> just, Fair <laughs> it enough. It takes money. It yeah. takes money to, to hire them editors and those and those uh, the cover art folks. So I think more than anything, I wanted to I wanted to go through the whole process. I wanted to pave the runway. I wanted to to do it and know that I knew how to do it. I really do hope that there's a couple stories out there 
-hmm. that says, thank you for taking the time to do this. I finally can forgive the person who abused me when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I can finally forgive my spouse. I can finally forgive the church. I can finally forgive myself. That would be one of the highlights of my life if somebody came to me and said, I read your book. And I have never been able to forgive myself for some of the things I've done. And now I can freely forgive myself and give myself permission to be beautiful and brilliant the rest of my life. That would be worth the thoughts of um, the effort it took to write the book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Nick, we are so excited for you. I'm so proud of you for doing this. Um, I've championed you like for years and years. I've said, get out there. More people need to know. Um, you're such a dynamic speaker, writer, just gives wisdom. It just flows freely from you. And this is definitely a topic every single person needs to really sit with. Um, like no matter where you're at, no matter what you've encountered, Something with forgiveness will come up in all of our lives. So this is definitely a book for everyone, which is also really cool. This is so accessible because each and every one of us will deal with this. Um, and there might be some unresolved stuff down deep in there that we probably should go ahead and take care of with forgiveness. Um, so this would be a great time. I implore everybody, go and buy this book. You will not be disappointed. So many people love you and have just grown because of your influence in their life. And so I know this book is just the beginning of more of that. So yay from all of us here at the Let's Process That podcast. We cheer you on and we're excited. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Thank you so much. So one more time, give us, we're rolling out the red carpet. You tell us where people can find your stuff. What's the easiest way to connect with you? Do you have anything else um, that they may be interested that might be on your website. What's Just give us all the next steps and how they can get their hands on a book. Sure. You can buy the book at Amazon, but you can also buy it at nickconnorcampbooks.com, and we've got some free resources there. We've got a free e-workbook that you can do, and also that allows you to interact with me, and I can interact with you a little bit. I'm also working on something where I can actually have appointments and meet with people around forgiveness issues one-on-one, -on -one. And so there's some stuff on nickhunterkentbooks.com that will be of value. And then I'll use that site as I add more material, more books, and more uh, resources like that. So I'm excited about that. Go check it out, and I think you'll enjoy it. Yes, yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for this insight. Thanks, like, Ann. Like I said, we are looking forward to this book and what's to come. Thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate it. Um, everything will be linked down in the description on how you can get this book, uh, just in case you need to go and have a quick click of the link. And there's also places for you to follow and interact with us individually and as a podcast. So we'd love to hear your feedback. Again, thank you so much to our producer, Adrian Vosch. Thank you to this amazing music that you're hearing by Caleb Honorkamp. And to anytime you see our faces in the professional, lovely photography, that is Allison Frost with Before the Foundations Photography, all linked below if you'd like to connect with them as well. We hope you guys have a great day and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.